we plow ahead now into the political portion of the conversation. Uh, and no better possible moderator for this than Jerry Seib, who's Washington bureau chief of the Wall Street Journal. You said you were at the Journal for 45 years. Is that true? Only 44. 44. <laughs> I get, usually the Journal's more reliable than that, but 44 to 45 years. I'm currently also a visiting fellow at the Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas. Uh, and author of We Should Have Seen It Coming, From Reagan to Trump, A Front Row Seat to a Political Revolution. Um, Jerry, I've gotten to know him over the past few years just because he has written so much on this exact question of what is uh, going on on the right and, and one of the few who our conversation has never had to be about what the heck is happening because I, he knows what the heck is happening on the right. Uh, and I think is is an ideal person to to facilitate this conversation about some of the political trends. So, Jerry, come on up. Thank you. Thanks. My book is a good book because Orrin is quoted in my book. Um, I, I want to start, I always like to start right now by reminding people that my colleague Evan Gershkovich is in prison still in Russia. This is day 328. So as somebody who spent four memorable days in Evan prison once in my reporting career, I can only imagine what he's going through. And our obligation is to just remember. So I just want to put that out there. Um, you know, I think we're all creatures of our own experiences, inevitably. And, and to me, for me, uh, the formative experience in my thinking about politics in America was 1980 when I was the young and wide-eyed political reporter at the Journal who would go anywhere and do anything. And the most important thing I did that year was to attend the convention in Detroit where Ronald Reagan was nominated to be the Republican candidate for president and then spent a couple of weeks flying around the country with Reagan while the real political reporters were off on vacation listening to what he was going to say and how he was framing his general election pitch. And that was the launch of what um, we all came to think of and later referred to as the Reagan Revolution. You know, four years earlier, Ronald Reagan was considered just too conservative, not just for America, but for his own party. By 1980, the country was open to his message, which hadn't really changed very much. And he won, and in the winning, became the patron saint of the conservative movement. And his message encapsulated what I think I and most of my colleagues and peers came to think of as the conservative economic formula. Tax cuts and lower regulation, free trade. It was in that 1980 campaign when Reagan started to make the pitch for what became the North American Free Trade Agreement. A federal government that stayed out of the marketplace, industrial policy, a term that Ron and her colleagues used on stage a few minutes ago was an obscene phrase to conservatives in those days. Uh, homage to the invisible hand of the uh, free hand in the markets, uh, odes to the economic benefits of immigration, attacks on the welfare state, welfare queens were a prominent part of Reagan rhetoric, a punching bag for him, pretty much unapologetic support for big business, uh, skepticism of if not outright hostility toward unions, uh, Reagan famously would go on within a couple of years to break the air traffic controllers union once he got into office. And that whole stew became what most practitioners on the right and most of us journalists came to see as the conservative economic message. And there were occasional heretics, Pat Buchanan most notably in 1992 and 1996, but conservatives and Republicans pretty much followed that gospel without trail um, both in presidential and congressional races for the next 30 years or so. And it was a politically winning formula. Republicans periodically took control of Congress, including the House for the first time in 40 years in the 1990s. And they won, three, they won uh, with that message um, the next five of the next seven ensuing presidential elections. So that's just the way conservatives were expected to be until 2016. That's when Donald Trump changed the formula. Now, Trump has no real ideology in my view, but he certainly doesn't share that conservative economic e ideology. He was and is against free trade. He certainly had nothing good to say about immigration. 
aside from perhaps the two immigrants that he married. Um, he didn't love big business. He was more than ready to use the power of the federal government to intervene in the marketplace, to force businesses to do what he wanted them to do. He, appeal, appear, he appeared open to union members, was courting them openly, at least. It was an entirely new take on conservative economics. And those of us who thought the Republican Party would never buy it in 2016 were just wrong. I was wrong about that. He won, and what he thought of as a conservative economic message was changed. Maybe not forever, but at least for now. So today you now have on the political scene, which we're going to discuss here, candidates and office holders such as Josh Hawley, J.D. Vance, Marco Rubio, who are more than happy to jettison big parts of the Reagan economic message. Which brings us to 2024 and the question that we're going to explore on this panel. What does this economic debate mean for political leaders and how is it being translated into electoral politics in 2024 and beyond? And to help me discuss this, happily, we have two very bright leading lights in this area. Tim Chapman, I'll ask him to come up, I don't know where Tim is. Oh, there he is. Um, Tim Chapman, Senior Advisor for Advancing American Freedom, and Michael Brendan Doherty, Senior Writer for the National Review. So I'd like you to welcome Tim and Michael with me, and we'll get started, and then we will open it up for your questions after we chat for a while. Thank you, guys. Sure. Uh, so let's, um, let's start with that 1980 campaign. Um, if we were in 1980 today, at the beginning of a presidential election year, um, what would the economic message be and how would it be different from what we are hearing today? Michael, why don't you start? If we were in 1980 now, um, well, it would be different in that the idea of a heavy regulatory state would seem a lot more credible to a lot more voters as an enemy. Mm. Um, unions even being a problem for getting employment or seeing employment might be um, more credible than they would be today. I mean, most, you know, we've seen a huge decline in union membership since then. Um, and also a subsequent decline in the open criminality of union leadership. Um, uh, it's kind of a vestige of the <laughs> mid 19th mid 20th you know, century. But I'm actually struck by some of the, you know some of the similarities. I mean, you know, there there were times when there was Reagan paraphernalia that said make America great again. Mm -hmm. The sense of lost um, prowess on the world stage, the sense of drift in foreign, you know, it kind of went along with a sense of drift in foreign policy with Afghanistan. Um, so there were there were elements of like we have to restore something that was lost. Of course, there was also, you know, most of the voters in 1980 had experienced serious inflation for, you know, uh, over almost over a decade, um, such that it was like a common joke in sitcoms at the time about the prices going up at the grocery store. So there, I'm, I'm struck a little bit by the similarities um, to our moment right now in 2024. Um, but... Uh, what's very different, I think, is the immigration piece, is that there was not, I mean, there was not a sense that the 1964 or 65 uh, reforms in immigration had brought about a total transformation of the country by 1980. Um, you know, there was just a beginning of a sense in the, in the cities that immigrants were starting to contribute um, to the renewal of city of city life that had fallen so far in the late 60s and 70s. Yeah, yeah. you know it's interesting, Tim. I, I yesterday I went back and reread Reagan's main campaign economic speech, which was to the Chicago Economic Club, and his um, acceptance, acceptance speech at the convention. And there are, in fact, great big chunks of there about the evils of mm -hmm. inflation, the regulatory state out of control, all the, that you will, in fact, hear from Republican candidates in 1980. Um, but I think the prescriptions about how to deal with those are quite different now. How are they different? Well, I, I first I agree there are a lot of similarities, and I think that's important. Um, I think that the Reagan platform of 1980 probably would be pretty applicable today uh, in terms of economics. I think the thing that's massively different 
is 40 plus years of kind of the progressive left being victorious in all sorts of institutions across this country. Conservatives feeling um, time and time again like they're on the short end of the stick when it comes to uh, the elites in this country. And, and, then, and then I would also say um, there's probably going to be a difference in foreign policy as well. Um, and foreign policy, the reason there's a difference, I think, is because of decades of failure. Um, decades of failure from our Republican leaders that we had hoped would, you know, deliver something different. So for me, when I look at this, it's a little bit, it's, I'm a little bit torn because I, I look at it and, I, and I've looked at those speeches too from Reagan and leading up in the 1980 campaign. I think the economic prescriptions make a lot of sense. I think they still work, but I think that there's a problem right now with our voters being able to believe that they still work. Um, we talked in the, in the first panel a little bit about this pendulum that keeps swinging back and forth. I completely agree with that. Um, I think the Reagan swing was a, was a reaction to the you know, FDR, post-FDR era. Uh, that was a collectivist era. And then you know, we had Reagan swing into an individualist era. And I think we're swinging back into a collectivist era. And what scares me as a conservative is that if you know, if the rhetoric that we adopt as conservatives becomes too collectivist, then you don't have a two-party system that works anymore. Like the two-party system that's worked for this country has been one, the Democratic Party, which often focused on equality, um, and the Republican Party, which has traditionally focused on individual liberty. And that's a very good marriage and it works very well. Um, but where we're headed right now, for a lot of the reasons that, that I described, or for a lot of the trends over the last 40 years, we're very susceptible to something different. And that, to me, is, uh, is a problem. You know, it's, um, it's an interesting point because um, the two parties divide on cultural issues now enormously. Mm -hmm. right. But maybe they're actually coming closer together on economic issues. Is that, I think that's what Tim's suggesting. Is that, is that really what's happening here? So I would disagree with Tim's characterization about giving all of the egalitarian instincts to the Democrats and none to conservatives. I actually think there's a, a huge part of the appeal of, of the populist message on the right is that um, you know conservatives want to fight for an equal right to space in cyberspace. They want to fight for an equal right to form an opinion on, um, you know, any topic apart from the managerial elite or its in institutions and its accreditation and uh, things, which they feel totally alienated mm -hmm. from. And you've seen that in ways that are healthy. Like I think uh, a lot of resistance to masks was a kind of egalitarian uh, things, and you've seen some stuff that's a little bit, a little bit more pathological, maybe. Uh, on vaccines, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think that egalitarian impulse is absent from the Republican Party. I think it's just expressed differently um, by a different set of Americans. And um, sorry, I probably uh, went on a little bit of a, a tangent there um, from from your question. Well, no, I, no, I think that's I think that's that's all relevant. I, I guess the question is, what are the dividing lines? To put it more precisely, what are the dividing lines between Democrats and Republicans? between liberals and conservatives on economic policy today? Because that's not as clear, I think, as it used to be. And that's what you were saying, mm -hmm. I think, Tim. Well, I think Tim is right about the alienation from, institution, from certain institutions. So one thing that's totally different from 1980 is conservatives don't trust higher education the way they did. Yeah. I mean, Republicans, we've so talked about the education shift, but um, if you look at what colleges do, I mean, we've spent so much time in our newspapers and magazines talking about, you know, Harvard and its president. But look at, um, you know, the bottom tier of colleges and how they function in our society. They get this huge uh, inducement to their existence from the way student loans are treated in the law. And what, what do they do? They produce colleges like there's one nearby me, Mercy College. Almost all of the students in Mercy College are brought into there by advertising saying, hey, you make a million dollars more over your lifetime if you have a college degree. The college does not advertise that it has like a sub 33% completion rate after six years. Almost all of the people who even complete the jobs go back to the service industry that they left with no improvement in their earnings. So what you've done is you've just used the government to load 
a giant debt load on a low, you know, five-figure earning worker to subsidize the existence of a totally mediocre six-figure professor and administrative class around them. And I think if we're looking forward to the politics of economic conflict in America between the parties, I think it's going to be this kind of cheek to jowl fight about discrediting certain inst- privilege, you know, dens of privilege that are dens of actual iniquity. I mean, those people at, the, at Mercy College, they don't think of themselves as vampires, um, you know, sucking the blood out of the working class <laughs> in society. But that's kind of what they are and how they function and how we want them to. We just feed them with all this nonsense about how they're giving the people a glorious liberal education that they were otherwise denied. They actually think they're egalitarians when, when in fact they're quite the opposite. Yeah. Um, so Tim, if, if those are the kinds of issues that um, really animate some of, the, some of the anger in the political mm-hmm. system, what's the, and you're a, you're a candidate in mm-hmm. 2024 and you recognize the, the cultural divides, but you also need an economic message mm-hmm. that is distinguishable from your democratic opponents. What is it? Um, well, look, I, when I first came to Washington 22 years ago, I read this little pamphlet by uh, a guy named Danny Kruger. He was the speechwriter for David Cameron. Um, and it was, a, it was a tiny pamphlet, but it was brilliant. It was called On Fraternity. Um, and he was making the argument that um, the last 50 years, uh, the debate in Western countries between the left and the right was about equality versus liberty. Um, but that the future of the debate uh, looked like it was a lot more about fraternity and uh, fraternity in the sense of belonging, in the sense of feeling knitted into a society and, um, and having your security there. Um, and, he, and his argument was that over the next 50 years, the, um, the party that figures out how to argue for fraternity best will be the victorious party. And the, and the challenge for conservatives um, was to, f- to make the argument for fraternity from a perspective of, of, of uh, liberty. That liberty was the most natural ally to fraternity and the most authentic ally to fraternity, not, not equality. So anyway, sorry for the phil- philosophical lesson, but I think that's important because I think what's happening now, if we're swinging into a collectivist age, I think there's a lot of instinct, and we see it all over the Republican Party right now, and a lot of the young senators that we mentioned earlier, a lot of, a lot of the House members that we're talking about, to like just rush to that kind of like populist collectivist platform without really thinking deeply about how uh, to make the argument from, a, from the perspective of liberty. And if we do that as a party, then we've, we've kind of, we've, we've ceded a lot of ground to the left and, and the country well, I think is in trouble. But give me an example. What's an economic policy that also enhances liberty? That, that enhances liberty? Um, you know, like, take the, take the one that's most derided from, from, from uh, populists on our side, tax cuts. Mm-hmm. I mean, tax cuts are clearly an, an enhancement of individual liberty, you know? And, you know, you, you get the reward from the work that you do. You, you get to take care of your family. That's an enhancement of individual liberty. I think we're, I, I, I do think to your question earlier, we are seeing, like, a convergence. Like, we're see, we, we will have, you know, if Donald Trump's reelected, there will be, an Elizabeth Warren, Josh Hawley piece of legislation that you know gets serious consideration on the floor. Um, I'm not sure what it is. It might be around antitrust, um, probably something like that. It could be around like bank regulations. Um, there are lots of these, like Roger Marshall, J.D. Vance are, are, are pushing lots of bank regulatory stuff that's Sherrod Brown is on. Like all of that kind of stuff, that's going to be where a lot of the energy is. Um, and there may be good reasons for some of those pieces of legislation, but I think, it's, I think it's trending in the wrong direction for the party. I think the party has to be the, the natural, we have to be the ones arguing for liberty, we have to be the ones arguing for freedom, and to the extent that we're not, country's worse off. So Michael, as I look at this, it seems to me that two areas where there's a clear partisan differentiation, and I'm, I'm going down this path in part because we all know that campaigns are about defining differences, not stressing similarities. So that's what we're facing in the next eight, nine months. Tax cuts and regulation strike me as the two areas where there's a clear difference between the two parties, even if a, with a new conservative economic message developing. But what about the other areas I mentioned? What about trade? What about 
uh, immigration, which you touched on previously. What about the role of the government and the economy more broadly? And what about executive power? What's the, what's the conservative message on those fronts? Hmm. Well, I, you know, it's funny. I want to quibble one, with one little thing about tax cuts. Just, um, I live in New York, and it's the Democrats who are screaming about cutting my taxes by restoring mm. the SALT no. deduction. Um, <laughs> you know, and you know, most blue state, de you know, blue, prosperous blue state Republicans will agree with them as well. Yeah. Uh, but they haven't, they haven't gotten it done. Fine bipartisanship, it's great. Because, <laughs> right, well, well, because red state Republicans are right that, you know, the SALT deduction is a kind of sop to high earning um, people in blue states with uh, a high tax burden uh, that, you know, they're fobbing off on the, f on the federal budget, essentially. Um, now, as far as the parties differentiating, I mean, Trump has been running on, I mean, I was talking about this a little bit with uh, Julius before we started today. Trump's running on getting revenge on his enemies, <laughs> uh, fixing elections so that he's not cheated again, and a tariff. And that's about it. I mean, he's not getting into the weeds of industrial policy. He's just saying tariff. And I think this is um, a mistake in the sense of it's too broad and unspecific. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels like, um, you know, it feels like William Jennings Bryan and we're just putting a, a, a one or two word uh, policy out there, silver, uh, <laughs> and expecting to get a landslide victory. On immigration, um, you know, the parties are obviously polarizing further and further. I mean, I think Trump's election polarized Democrats to the point where many of them view, literally view immigration enforcement at the border itself as an act of white supremacy, right? That it's totally illegitimate. It, um, you know, it is merely preserving the, uh, the current demographic balance of the country to the benefit of, uh, you know, its existing citizens rather than uh, the, the future, which is, uh, by definition, better and more deserving of um, a political power, and the sooner we can get there, the better. Mm. Um, I think that's put Biden in an unbelievable, unbelievably difficult position. Um, politically, I don't think it's credible for him to blame, you know, Republicans passing up the border bill in this in this compromise in the Senate. Um, it might that might have worked before Donald Trump. Um, in an era where people had never seen the border under control since 2003 or four, when it, uh, it really started getting uh, haywire and we got the first push for immigration ref reform comprehensively. Uh, it's just not gonna work now. People know that Biden's policy of the border was to open it up um, and he did so deliberately and consciously. Uh, he may slow the flow and, and I think he will. I think already his, he's doing so by uh, diplomacy with Mexico more than any other means. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's going to convince any voters who vote on immigration. But um, no, I, the the um, Republicans will, will be fighting on that issue. And we, we should expect immigration to continue to be a major dividing line in politics, I think, worldwide, um, namely because we, we, we've gone through this unacknowledged revolution where the price of emigration has totally collapsed not just because travel is cheaper, but because you can FaceTime back home. And, you know, psychologically, it's, there's much less risk-taking involved. Um, you know, when my mother's family came over in the 1860s, they would have held a funeral in Western Ireland for them because they will never see you again. Mm. Uh, it's very different than now where, you know, um, I, you know, uh, Thomas Friedman-like, I took the cab over here this morning and my Ethiopian <laughs> cab driver was talking back home to Ethiopia, <laughs> you know, um, you know, for it, an astonishingly low rate. So um, as as that price of emigration has collapsed psychologically, as far as the amount of risk taking you need in your personality, the um, or the, even the amount of desperation you need to be faced with, I think um, you're going to the trend around the world is to see border walls going up um, and hardening. 
Uh, that's not just uh, a United States thing. That's that's global. Um, so, Tim, I'm wondering if you think the uh, presidential primary season on the Republican side, such as it's been, um, has offered any uh, clarifying elements <laughs> to this debate. Because, you know, I. <coughs> Well, we know what Trump is saying, mm -hmm. as, as Michael said. It's not about economics. It's about grievance and, and um, uh, culture. But you do have Nikki Haley, who I think represents kind of the, what's l probably left of a kind of more traditional Reagan-esque economic message. Have we learned anything from what she's saying and whether it's getting traction and what Trump isn't isn't saying? Has there been any light shed by this primary? None. None, None whatsoever. I mean, look, I... I don't think this primary has been a real primary. I mean, this is, you know, we have an incumbent running. The party has made it very clear who they want to, to win this <clears throat> nomination and be their standard bearer. And look, there are all sorts of reasons for that. Um, and I think we've talked about some of those reasons. What, what really, like, what haunts me is, so Ronald Reagan won, what, 44 states mm -hmm. in 1980. Complete landslide victory. Um, he was able to put together a coalition that has all the elements of the Trump coalition, uh, but probably did better among independents and better among suburban voters. Um, now, Trump is headed for what I think will be a very narrow victory if they don't get Biden out of this race. But it's going to be narrow, and it's going to depend on the Philadelphia suburbs, and it's going to depend on Wisconsin, uh, and it's going to depend on states like that and areas like that. It's going to be skin of, skin of his teeth. Um, I, you know, perhaps I'm naive about this, but I think if you transplant Ronald Reagan into Donald Trump's place and you run Ronald Reagan, in the, even in this environment, even in a more collectivist age, you know, and you run on his platform, you, run, you win 44 states again. That's how weak Biden is. Even at 108 years old. Even at 108. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he'd just barely be there. <laughs> is that what he would be right now? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, if you knew that off the top of your head, that's pretty good. So, I, look, I mean, I, I, I just think that um, and, and to Michael's point, like Trump's not running on a, on a platform. Trump, Trump is like an avatar of vengeance. That's what he is. And I get why our people want an avatar of vengeance. Um, but there is a there's an election there to be had by somebody that's not like that. Uh, but we are not in a place as a party right now to be able to do that. Um, and, and I'm not sure we had the candidate either. But the one thing Ronald Reagan would never have done is go on Fox Business News and say, I propose a 10% tariff on everything. Tariffs are great. Is yeah, and I don't think the tariff is what's going to lift Trump to victory. Mm. So, so I, I mean, I think the tariff is a symbol. I care about working class voters, right. right? But I don't think people are going to the polls and they're, you know, voting for... Trump supporters would support Reagan's policies. They would do they, and and look, I've no, I, I know this because you know I spent enough time where I, I worked with Haley for a while. I spent time working with Pence. Like I, I've seen the internal polling of of the uh, of, of of Republican voters. There, the Republican voters are pretty conservative. You know, they want lower taxes. They want less government. You know, they you know on trade they're moving a little bit on Ukraine. That's another issue. Okay, and like the polling is amongst Republicans is going the way I wouldn't want to see it go on that. But like on general economic issues, they still say that they're conservative. So they would vote for this guy, but like they, they would vote for Reagan um, and Reagan's policy platform. And you'd probably win more. You know, the um, that gets to an important point here, which is the not only is the message changing, the degree of change we can debate, the target has changed significantly. You know, I, Ronna raised her hometown in the Midwest. I'll raise my hometown in the Midwest. I'm from a little town called Hayes, Kansas, in western Kansas. I went back and looked. In 1964, that town went, my home county, went 75% for Lyndon Johnson. It was just, it was Democratic, you know, German immigrant Democrats. By 2020, it went 75% for Donald Trump. I think a lot of that had to do with culture, not economics. But my point is, Republicans are talking to a different set of voters in 2024 than they were in 1980. Um, 1980 was the beginning of Reagan Democrats, yeah. the emergence of Reagan Democrats. Mm -hmm. But that was the beginning. Talk about how far that process has advanced as you see it. Jeez. Um, I mean, is 1980s? I mean, literally. You're, invite, you're inviting someone who's middle-aged, and I wasn't born in 1980. <laughs> so um, 
we are very far away from that. I, I grew up in a, a household of, you know, um, FDR, Democrat coalition, Irish Catholics mm -hmm. that were stuck with the party through Kennedy and had, you know, one set of cousins who were entrepreneurial and then they were the, the headbanging Reaganites. The weird Republican cousins. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, the ones who were raising money for Dan Quayle in <laughs> 1990, you know, and, um, um, Life, uh, life has significantly changed. I mean, the the, the Republican Party has been moving, uh, has been like essentially downwardly mobile among whites, especially for years. I mean, we've been reading about this since David Brooks was writing in his twenties in the Weekly Standard, you know, about the uh, Republicans of Cook County who couldn't understand what Newt Gingrich and this culture war thing was all about. You know, the, um, you know, the country club. Republican image is just severely mm -hmm. outdated. And, you know, one of the big posting signs for me along this, you know, it hasn't completely disappeared, but one of the, you know, little warning lights went on for me during the Obama years when Obama proposed what I thought was a very modest uh, change to 529 college savings mm -hmm. plans. And it sunk like a rock. Uh, it, immediately, you couldn't you couldn't do anything to take away this minor privilege that the most tax privileged constituency in America already enjoys, because they were his base, mm -hmm. um, and they were they were totally revolted from it. Um, now, it's it, and it's not that um, it's definitely cultural issues. It's not just you know workers and capital uh, anymore. That that describes almost no industry now, the political divide in it. You see industries divided by politics where both the owners and the workers are on the same side, yeah. where the managers and the workers are on the same side of the political divide. Um, you know, everyone at my barbershop is a conspiratorial Republican. Mm -hmm. Everyone at the Honda dealer, from the owner to all the service technicians, to the floor salesmen are Republican. Almost everyone at the public school is a Democrat. Yeah. Um, so it is, there, there are definitely cultural issues and that's why I said I'm, I worry that as we delve into a more uh, economic fight about how do we distribute the resources of the pie that America is building, it is going to be a, a fight within communities and cheek by jowl, industry by industry, who is benefiting from unjust privilege, uh, or who deserves more of pr more protection in some way? Do we want to keep protecting the lowest third of colleges with the the way they're um, they're given this gusher of money from the government through the student loans, or do we want to protect you know some workers with that with those resources? Yeah, um, I want to open it up to, to your all questions in just a minute, but but Tim, let me before we do that, let me ask you to pick up on something here, which is the working class. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Is the Republican now the party of the working class? Mm -hmm. And secondly, what, is it, what does the term working class even mean in this economy? I mean, is, is, it a, is it a passe term to begin with or not? Yeah, I mean, look, I think they are certainly the party of the white working class. Um, and they're gaining inroads uh, among uh, African-American working class and Hispanic working class. Um, so I would give the, I would say that it is certainly changed. It's a lot different than, than 1980. Um, I think working class basically means you're working a 40 hour week, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're probably on wage pay, uh, your hourly pay. Um, and like working class tends to be like, you know, you, you've got one, you got two parents working and you know, kids are in public school and you know, increasingly, that's that's what what it is. I my my frustration is that the party right now. I, I think it's wonderful that the party has become the party of the working class. I think that's a, a development that like we have wanted to see for decades, right? But instead of becoming the party of the working class and and projecting some sort of aspirational like upwardly mobile vision, um, it's a it, it it it's a message of of you know, vengeance or a message of, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's a very negative, uh, it's, it's a, and, and, and our perspective as a party is that this pie will never grow. 
um, and that you are stuck where you are. And so we are going to have all these fights for the scraps. And like all we're doing as a party is fighting with the left over which particular group gets it. And that's not what the Republican Party has at its best always been. Yeah. And so again, that's a loss for the country. Um, and, and that's where I get you know pretty frustrated with with this debate and and with uh, with. And look, I know these guys. I know these young senators. I know the some of the guys that work for them are some of my best friends. You know, I've worked with them for decades. But to me, it's a very frustrating thing to keep talking down to our voter. Well, you know, it's interesting because in my view of this is that these, all these working class voters, the guys at the Honda dealership that you referred to at the barbershop, they moved into the Republican Party over the last 20 years for cultural reasons. Mm -hmm. Now that they're there, the party's trying to come up with an economic message that catches up with its new membership. Is right. that a fair right. summary? Right, and so I, m my preference would be, let's go hard on the cultural issues, okay? Yes, you are being persecuted. Your, your way of life is on the outs in this country. We are gonna fight for you on, from that perspective. But on the economic message, have a very positive message. Like, here's how we're gonna grow the economy. The pie's gonna get bigger. The future can be better for you. Um, but we're going negative on both. Mm. Yeah. Um, let me let me see who has questions here. Uh, we can start here. I think there's a microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll come to you next. Yeah, go for it. Uh, hi. So I'm Joseph Tobias Roy, uh, reporter with Simon Four. Thank you for organizing the event. Uh, my question is uh, originally going to be directed to Tim. You made you made a really interesting comment just now about um, the GOP making inroads with working class voters, particularly blacks and Latinos, I think that's starting to show up in the polling as well. So what would you attribute that, um, that trend that we're seeing right now? It's cultural. I mean, the, a lot of that is cultural. It's, you know, if African-Americans and Latinos um, are, tend not to be on board with the woke agenda of the left, um, especially Latinos, and I think there's no way to identify with what the left is pushing right now. Um, so I, like, I, I know we've talked a lot about economics today, but it feels like the, the biggest driver of this whole thing is how we're changing, you know, how, how we're changing in terms of our values as Americans. Um, and, then the, and then the disconnect between, you know, people's own personal values and what they see, whether they're watching TV or what they see at the public school or what they see, you know, even in some of their church, churches or whatever institutions across this country. And, there's only one party right now that's saying this is crazy uh, and we're going to send a crazy guy to go screw the whole thing up, you know? Um, and so I think that's where the, the, that's where the main draw is. Um, but I wouldn't put all the economic stuff past uh, la Latino and African-American support. I do think that there is like the deregulation is an important thing. Um, I, I think, you know, a lot of people, especially immigrants who have come here, um, or appreciate uh, the the capacity to make a living, um, and, um, and and that's an important part of it, but mostly cultural. I I think it's cultural too, but I actually think I would point to uh, the this dribble of African American and Latinos into the Republican Party among the working class. It's almost entirely men. And uh, I think it's part of a broader trend you're seeing in several countries of polarization of the sexes politically, yeah. um, dragging people where, where men feel like um, whatever it is about the center left and it's more egalitarian, culturally sensitive message mm -hmm. is somehow excluding them or does not care about them or sees them as like fundamentally a problem. Um, so I, I I think it's mostly cultural. I still think the Republican Party absolutely struggles to um, <laughs> speak to those voters' economic concerns. And also, because we are not the party of labor unions, we are terrible about organizing those voters, mm -hmm. reaching out to them and getting them to turn out in midterm elections. Um, and also, they're, they're, it's probably reflective, too, of the Republican Party's um, ascendance among people who are atomized and who are not uh, part of major civic associations, the people that don't go to church anymore, um, divorced dads, you know, this group, a lot of them are hardcore Republicans now. And they're a very hard constituency to, to rely on if you're looking for that um, 
you know, off cycle election in New York yeah. where George Santos is being replaced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm gonna go here and then I'll come back there. Hi, I'm Bill Mower, a candidate for uh, the U.S. House of Representatives in Virginia's 8th District, mm -hmm. just across the river. And my question is about optimism, you know, and I couldn't agree with you more on your, your points. You know, Ronald Reagan, it was morning in America with Reagan. You know, make America great again is optimism faced in the wrong direction. You know, America's great every day. Every day is morning in America. And we need our leaders, you know, leaders of, of the conservative movement to embrace that because we're not going to out, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to, to tackle big issues like climate change with the Democrat playbook saying the world is headed to hell in a handbasket and the only way we can do it is by having less of us here, you know. So my, my question is, is how, you know, where do you see optimism in any party <laughs> so today. I, I agree with what you're saying. I Look, let me just say, so I, I've spent the last two decades just like in the trenches, the bowels of the conservative movement. I've worked on uh, various different Senate, in different Senate offices. I spent 15 years at the Heritage Foundation. Um, and then the last few years have been with uh, some other leaders in the movement. I'm working with Mike Pence now. So I've kind of, like I've been around this forever, and I will say this about traditional Reagan conservatism. I do think over the last couple of decades, we got to a place where the movement began to. Um, it was like Reagan was such a success. You know, he was an icon for everything that we had ever hoped for as conservatives. Um, and then people like me got to Washington in 2001, um, and it was like this you know, this figure hanging over everything. And we, we tended to like, um, we tended to create a religion out of Reaganism. Um, and I think that, that there's a reaction against that now. Um, and like where Reagan himself, like if he were running today, he wouldn't be like absolutely strictly adhering to every single, you know, plank he ran on in 1980. He would be adapting to where we are. And I think we just got so atrophied as a movement, and there's been a rebellion against that. Um, and the rebellion against that, I think, is understandable, but is harmful in that it's like putting down um, the, the principles of Reaganism and the principles of conservatism um, and doing it in, in such a way um, as to be very, very negative. So I, but I don't think that there's a, like, I, I think the problem we have right now is the leaders that you're talking about, like they don't exist. Like there's a lot of them that don't exist. Like a lot of them are leaving. Like Mike Gallagher is leaving. Why is and Gallagher Sass leaving? Too. Right? Sass left. Yeah. Like Mark Green is retiring. Like I, I was really concerned about both Gallagher and Green because I looked at those two guys and I thought both of them were the types of conservatives that adhered to, well, like Reaganism principles, but also were you know adept enough to be able to you know take Oren's material and weave it into what he's doing um, and and to be optimistic about it and they're gone and they're gone because that's not what the movement is today because the movement doesn't want that um, and so that's a problem I don't see optimism anywhere I mean yeah maybe I mean maybe at the World Economic Forum they think like they're getting close to giving up on humanity. Even them, <laughs> they'll yeah. consent to be robotized <laughs> and whatever. But um, you know, among Democrats, I see an attitude of we want the bare minimum of humane policies towards immigrants and women, and that's provoking the majority of the country to embrace fascism and destroy democracy. Mm -hmm. And on the right, among or and even among just young people, it's like my future. They want me to eat bugs, live in the pod, <laughs> and um, not own a home. I mean, you know. Nobody in my family under 30 believes that home prices in the area where their parents lived will have any relationship to their income in, in a decade or a decade or two to come. Mm -hmm. they're, they're being told to move out, you know, have a two-hour commute or get a job uh, telecommuting to wherever opportunity is. 
um, you know, your parents' home prices have to continue to be inflated by constricted supply until they die to pay for their uh, extortionate uh, pharmaceutical prices and um, their uh, retirement in the villages. Um, you know, I, I think you're not going to see optimism uh, from, I think, either party until the American dream seems more achievable than it does right now, which is the white picket fence with uh, that you can actually afford. And, uh, yeah, it's gone. So I'll, I'll pile on to the darkness <laughs> here. But I was thinking just yesterday that, you know, Gene Kirkpatrick um, created this phrase, the blame America first crowd, which mm -hmm. he used to refer to the Democrats. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking, like, both parties are basically the blame America first crowd now. That, you know, Tucker Carlson says the, the Putin invaded Ukraine, and that's our fault because we gave him excuses and made NATO too scary to him. And Hamas attacks Israel, and the left says that's our fault because we've been too supportive of Israel. I mean, there is this kind of blame America firstism that is the opposite of optimism that seems to be afoot in both parties right now. But anyway, Chuck, you had a question. Hold on one second. Thank you. Um, Charles Lane, Washington Post. Thank you for a good Thank panel. You, um, first, an observation about 1980. I remember that year very well because I just got my driver's license. And in the prior year, my father had taken advantage of that to make me wait in the gas lines. Um, <laughs> and by 1980, gas prices had spiked to what was then the all-time high of $1.35. That is my way of saying that I really think there's no comparison between what we were talking about at the beginning, the economic predicament this year, and what Reagan was running against in 1980. But that sets up my next question, which is, I was thinking back to elections as you guys were talking in our recent 20th, 21st century history, and trying to think which ones were decided by economic policy differences, mm -hmm. as opposed to just reaction to bad economic conditions. And I wonder if you guys could reflect on whether you think, if you look at the closer elections we've had, whether all the things we're talking about are, are in the, on economic policy have ever really been decisive as opposed to more cultural <laughs> points that you're talking hmm. about. So I, I think, I think, I don't know if I want to say it's policy, but I think economic affinity was absolutely decisive in Obama triumphing over Clinton in the primaries uh, and beating uh, Romney in the very states that then Donald Trump took from Hillary Clinton's coalition. I think the, you know, what Michael Moore called the Brexit states, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, they looked, they always chose the candidate who, whether they were lying or not, or or overselling it or not, was criticizing NAFTA and seemed to be the the bigger trade hawk. So I, th I think it did, it does absolutely matter in those states. Um, and it's it's why J.D. Vance represents Ohio and maybe why he doesn't represent Mississippi. Um, so it, it matters, uh, at least regionally, if not nationally. I think that's a good question, though, because I, I I think the, the way I would think about it is like, what elections for president resulted in a mandate for something economic? That would be the way to turn it around and think about that. And like, certainly Bush's reelection didn't result in a mandate. He thought he had a mandate for, you know, social security reform. Turns out he didn't have a mandate for social security reform. Um, elections have resulted in some big tax cut bills. The first election resulted in a big tax cut bill. Trump's election resulted in a big tax cut bill. But I don't think Trump made taxes a centerpiece of his campaign. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's a good point that, um, that a lot of this is reactionary and that maybe the economic policies that are being proposed are not as, as important. That's why I think this tariff thing, um, I don't think this is a, I don't, I don't think a, what is it, 20% or 10% across the board tariff that he's talking about. I don't think it's a serious policy. <clears throat> I think it's a symbol. Um, and it's just a symbol to 
um, to say that like we care about working class voters in the manufacturing sector, um, and that's and that's important for him for for, for a few different states. Um, we could go on, but we can't because the clock is telling me we have to quit. But thanks for the good questions. Thanks to both of you. Um, maybe we need to come back in a few months and revisit. But uh, anyway, appreciate the chance. <clears throat>